Thank you. So, hi, thank you for coming. Um, I was very lucky that for most of my professional life, I was able to work with Qt in one way or another. We just changed about one and a half years ago when I moved on to a completely new job, new project, and we use pure C++. And I was quite surprised that I found my way around the new code base fairly quickly. I could you know, start using the internal APIs, the libraries we have, and it, was, it felt natural to me. And I didn't think too much about it until a couple months later when I was doing some KDE hacking and for like the 1,000th time, I had to go to the Q documentation to check on the ownership of Q network reply. And that's when I realized that the reason why I was able to find my way around the new code base at my new work was because the API was very expressive. It tell, tells the intent that the developer of the API has so that for me as a newcomer, it is very easy to understand, oh, so I'm supposed to take on take over the ownership, or oh, now I'm supposed to pass the ownership, and so on. So this talk is uh, showing two, really just two examples, because otherwise I could, we would be here all day. Uh, but I've cherry-picked two examples from modern C++ that I really, really, really like, and I want to present them to you. So you can see that these APIs are, APIs are similar, but they don't really express the intention, right? The first one actually transfers ownership. You are supposed to delete the Q network reply yourself. The other one does not. So this would be an easy fix, right? This already tells the intention that, wow, the Q network access manager actually gives you the network reply and you are supposed to delete it. While the other one, well, you don't really know what to do with it because it's just a raw pointer, so you better not touch it. The thing is, Qt is often heralded that it has, it's well designed, very stable, uh, consistent API, and rightly so. The problem is that lots of the patterns are based on you know, 20 years ago. And even though we say that now we use C++ 11 or 14, if you really look around not just the Qt code, but also KD code base, what you find is we don't really use C++11. We use, still use C++03, and we just sure picked auto and lambdas, and that's basically it. We don't use much else from whatever the language has. Right? So when I speak about C++ and modern C++, there are two parts of it. There's the core language, the language itself, and the syntax that it has, right? So uh, this needs to be supported by compilers. So for C++11, those were lambdas. For C++14, uh, this was function template arguments deduction. Uh, the other part is the standard library, right? That's all the, uh, all the template classes and algorithms that, are part that come with your compiler. And sometimes those do require the new API, but sometimes they don't. Uh, sorry, the new uh, language features, but very often the, the library features that come with C++17, for instance, they could very, very well work with C++14 as well. So uh, the two examples I'm going to show, they are from C++17, and since we do not use C++17 that much in KDE, uh, you can very easily find uh, lots and lots of well, not that many, but you can find quite a few, like a single header implementation on GitHub that are compatible with C++17, but they can be used with C++11 or 14 very easily. So here are the two cases. What if? So what if a function may or may not return a value? So how do you express that you have a function and the function may not find something or it may fail? Uh, you can imagine some settings class, right, that reads values and it may not find the option in the config file. So how do you express that? Well, we could throw an exception, but <laughs> we don't like exceptions that much. So we could return a pointer, right? So if we find that option in the config file, 
it would return a pointer to rectangle. If it doesn't find the option, it would return a null pointer. This is annoying, though. First, this is a value class, because rectangle is just a value. So why would you return a pointer to a value class? And how would you return? But, and you wouldn't do this with integers, right? You would not return a pointer to integer just to be able to represent a lack of the value. So what do you do? Uh, well, you could pick a random value and say, this is a special value. And this special value means there is no value. So sometimes we pick 0, sometimes we pick minus 1, sometimes minus 2, sometimes minus max int or mi minus max int plus 1 or something like that. But this is problematic uh, because not always you can do it. Sometimes you have a function that can fail, but it also, if it doesn't fail, it has to use, it can use all the values from the range of the type. This is a perfect example. This is a horrendous uh, C style 1970s API. What the hell is this doing in my 2019 code base, right? Um, I don't like this function at all. I hate it. Uh, first, it doesn't actually force you to error check because, because uh, there's the null, the null pointer as the default argument to the error checking, right? So basically, if you are just lazy or a new programmer and you do not know about this, you might be tempted to somewhat forget it. So what I would do is probably, well, I'm not, I think I'm missing some slides, but normally you would probably get rid of the null pointer at least to f actually force the developer to say, well, I know what I'm doing. I'm passing in a null pointer explicitly. Uh, the way we do this in Qt very often is that we define a null state of the type. Right? So we have qString is null, and qRect is null, and qSize is null. Um, this is a, also a bit problematic, though, because you have a function that actually returns a value of type qString. And now it doesn't tell you the intention that, well, it could it is a qString, but it is in null state. So it actually is not a qString because we haven't found it. So this puts the burden on you as a user of the API to realize, so do I have to do the error checking here, or is this OK? Can this fail? Do I have to check if the qString is null, or will this always succeed? I, you can't really tell, right? And we are not Rust developers. We don't want to error check everything. And there are, of course, classes or types that cannot have a null state, right? So I cannot have a null state of color because, well, what would I fill for all the three colors, all the three components? Because, well, if I put zeros in there, it's not a null color. It's, it's a black color, right? And black is a very cool color. So I need something else. And the thing that C++ offers is std optional. Uh, std optional is a template class that either holds a null value or it holds a value of type t. So this way I can so this is so this explicitly basically says that well there is either nothing or there is something in me and then you have to check. So we could have the same API as we had before to read some settings. And we could have a function that reads a string and returns an std optional q string, right? Because this explicitly says this may fail and it may return nothing. And you have to do the error checking. And then you can have the alternative overload, which like gets track or default, which takes the second argument, the second argument, and then if it doesn't find the option in the config file, it will return the value of the default the default value. So the function will never fail, so it returns only a queue string. And you know, OK, so I don't have to do error checking here, because I will always get a valid value that I continue to use. Um, I forgot to apologize beforehand for the amount of C++ code in these slides. Um, it will get worse. So this is an example of how you would use the API, right? Um, the std optional has a very nice getter called value or, value underscore or. So it either returns the value stored in the optional, or if the optional is null, it returns the value you give it. So this actually 
means you would not need the second overload even. Uh, you can also check if the name has value, and then you can try to read the value or the reference it, and you will get the value. This really forces you to do the error checking because you got something that is not a queue string, it is an optional queue string. So you know you have to do error checking, also because if you <laughs> try to access the value and it contains a null value, then it will throw an exception and abort your program. So you do want to check the value. So this was one example. Uh, other example is, what if a function wants to report an error? So you have a function that, I don't know, tries to read a file, access a network, whatever, and it fails. And you just don't want to fail silently. You want to tell the user that something went wrong, or you need to pass some details about what went wrong to the calling code. So how do you do this? Well. You could throw an exception, but we still don't like exceptions, so let's try something else. Inspired by qString to int, we could use a return argument. I've already mentioned before, return arguments are evil, and you should not use them. Uh, especially not with a default value, because then you are basically letting the developers be lazy. And because developers are lazy, you should do this. So you have you force them to explicitly say, I know what I'm doing, or I am or explicitly have the developer to admit that he's lazy and pass in a null pointer. Ideally, you, would s you won't even give them a choice, and you actually force them to pass in something. It's up to them if they then check what's in the error afterwards, but that's a different discussion. So what if we do not want to uh, use return argument. Well, then we have only one option, and that's we need we need to return somehow multiple values from the function. So we could just return a struct, which either optionally contains an error, or it contains the JSON document. For instance, if it's a JSON parser. The problem here is that it can sort of be in an it has a couple of states which are not really sensible. So what if the function fills in both? Right? Then that's not a defined state. Or what if it doesn't fill any of those? That's also a weird state. There was no error, but there is no document either. So what the hell happened? So it would so we need something even better, right? We want uh the function to be able to return two types, but always only one of them, right? Um, there is this thing that, for some reason, everybody hates, and that's Union. Uh, and C++17 introduced a much smarter version of Union called STD variant. Do not confuse STD variant with Q variant. Uh, those are different things. While Q variant can hold literally anything, STD variant can only hold one of the values of the type that is specified in the template. Right? If you want something, if you would want something like Q variant, there's std any, which is weird. So this is what the function would like. So the function returns an std variant of JSON document and QString. So it returns a value which is either a JSON document or a QString. Cannot be none, cannot be both. It's always one or the other. Uh, that, of course, can be more of those. The variant can have any number of types, but in this case, like two makes sense. But this is still not really expressive, right? This doesn't tell me what the queue string actually means. Is it, uh, I don't know, is it a hello world? Is it how long it took? It could be anything. So I would do something like this. Define a type def to queue string, call it error message, and then I can see that the function either returns a JSON document or an error message, right? It's a single easy, uh, one line of code, it has no compilation overhead, no runtime overhead. It just makes your API more expressive, more easier to use for other developers. Um, to showcase another reason, oh, uh, this is crazy, but this is how you would use it. 
So std variant has this um, get if thingy. So you can ask if it contains an error message, then return a pointer to it. The other op the other way you can do it is you can check if it holds alternative, then gives you true or false, and then using std get, you get the type it holds. Um, this is very similar to the API you know. One of the things I like about the variant in C++ 17 is that it also introduced std visit, which allows you to write um, basically using the visitor pattern. So at the end, and I'm a bit abusing it, but it still works very nicely because it allows you to put all the things into a single block. So you, you, you have your success and error handling in one block of code, right? So at the end, I will start from the end. At the end is the, uh, the variant that you want to check. And then you put in a lambda that is called when the variant contains the JSON document. And then you put another lambda that is called if the variant contains the error message. This doesn't work on its own. You need to do this overload template magic uh, if you want to look. This is not part of the standard, but just copy paste it from CPP reference like I do every time. <laughs> it's a two line template. And so this makes your life much easier as well. Um, so these were two examples of how you can make your API way more expressive than just returning a pointer or a queue string without telling the user any more information. Um, the conclusion would be use smart pointers, obviously. We should have been doing it for decades, not in the past three years. Use optional, use variant, use all the nice things that modern C++ uh, has. If you can switch to actual modern C++, so that means if you can leave C++ 11 behind, which is eight years old by now, and switch to something that is not so old, maybe just two years old, then switch to C++ 17. It has some very nice features that will made, not necessarily can improve the expressiveness of your APIs or whatever, but it can make your code in general more readable. Um, and, well, that was fast. So, thank you, and any questions? I guess that's one of the features of C++, is you don't pay for you don't what you don't use. And so, we have lots of time for other questions on more techniques. Albert. So we obviously are not using these things in frameworks. Uh, how would you go on doing this? Because like that probably means uh, breaking the API, like like the AVI event, because you need to change the sure. I don't know if return times are part of the AVI or not, but uh, there's things to be changed, right? So do you think it makes sense to do it now? Wait for framework six if that ever happens or. Yeah, that, that, that's a great point. I think now is a really good time to go fix this in Qt for Qt 6 and start looking into doing this for frameworks. And probably, you know, it's not like now go and change everything to optional. You need to think about, you know, where this makes sense and probably need some guidelines, some thinking how and when this should actually be used. My initial uh, initially, I was really excited about this thing, so I tried started putting it everywhere, and then realized nah, this is not the right way to go. So, but yeah, um, start putting it somewhere. It breaks API, but we have to at some point to move on. Otherwise, we'll be stuck with the C++ 03 forever. So, just one comment uh, regarding variant for. Well, uh, okay, so what do you think, I'm going to rephrase it, what do you think about libraries like boost outcome and boost expected as a replacement for the exact use case of variant that you had? Is it okay? Right, as far as I know, there was std expected proposed for 17, but they not get in, right? So, sure, yeah, use boost if you want to use boost. Boost awesome. Other questions? 
Yeah, at the keynote uh, about Qt6, um, it was mentioned that the containers will be wrapped in standard uh, containers. And uh, I thought about uh, all the Qt pointers we have, like uh, Q pointer and Q shared pointer and all of these, and then their C++ equivalents of modern C++. So what's your opinion on these? Can they be also like share concepts or be replaced or not everything probably. But I, yeah. I don't know enough, enough about the differences. If we can make Q shared pointer just a type def or wrapper around STD shared pointer and stuff, I, I don't know. One thing I know is that we either should have a Q unique pointer or get rid of Q scope pointer and force everyone using STD unique pointer because right now we have Q scope pointer and unique pointer, STD unique pointer, which are very similar, but not really, right? Because they are not, the, Q, the Q scope pointer is not movable, and as far as I know, they tried to make it movable, then realized this is stupid and reverted it, so. So, uh, which compilers can actually build code like this? Sure, JCC can, Clang can, what about MSVC? And yeah, what I'm aiming at is more like this is, this is a new code and code like this tends to uncover compiler bugs. And the next question is, did your code ever find a compiler bug? Uh, so, the supported compilers is recent enough GCC and that's been GCC supported for a couple of years now. So does Clunk, even on BSD, on Mac as well. Uh, on Windows, the latest version of MSVC has C++ 17 support. I don't know what state their standard library is in, but because I don't care about Windows. Uh, but well, you can compile it on all platforms if you have a recent enough compiler. That's I think the except for Haiku and this weird stuff, I have no idea. They probably still compile by hand. Um, the second question, no, I don't think I found a compiler error. I found a, I found a linker error in link time optimization. That's fun to debug. Other questions? If not, thank you, Dan, for your thank talk. You.